want to let everyone know today's guest is going to be well worth listening to. In fact, it could be life changing. Yes, life changing, not only for us, but also for you out there. Yeah, and if you think we're exaggerating, we're not. <laughs> indeed, indeed, we're definitely not. We interviewed our guests before the show, and we were overwhelmed by her thoughts and ideas because they were so fabulous. Yeah, this is be a great episode. Hope you've been having a wonderfully creative week. I'm Rod Jones, and we celebrate what people love to do creatively by giving them a voice so you can learn and be motivated from their life's experiences. And I'm NG Jones. Welcome to Thought Row Podcast. We invite you to subscribe wherever you listen, and we focus on sharing with everyone how they can think, be, and live more creatively. Okay, NG Jones, <laughs> how about tell our listeners who our guest is today? Okay, our guest today is Allison Butters, and she's an extraordinary life coach, NLP practitioner, and uses hypnosis and timeline coaching, and she's going to share some valuable insights on how to improve our lives. Yeah, she's a great guest. Mm -hmm. But first, let's hear your motivational quote for today. Okay, here is the quote for this episode, and it goes like this. The happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. Therefore, guard accordingly and take care that you entertain no notions unsuitable to virtue and reasonable nature. And that quote is by Marcus Aurelius. You know, I, I don't think you could have picked a better quote for today's episode. And it's one of those that I think I'm going to really try to commit to memory. You know, I hope you do. And I, I really want to, too, because it was so good, I think, to hang on to that and keep that in the forefront of your, your mind. Yeah, it's worth retaining that yeah. So let's introduce our guest. But first, I know you have an important message for our listeners. Yes, I do. And, you know, we've been reluctant to come right out and ask everyone. But if you are listening to this podcast, can you do us a little favor and help us out? On our website, we have an added a feature where you can help support the podcast. And it's called Buy Me a Cup of Coffee. And if you scroll down on the website on thoughtrow.com, um, you'll see the button where it says, buy me a cup of coffee. And there you can donate as little as a dollar. And it really would help out with our podcast costs that we have with production and with website costs. So please, if you guys enjoy the podcast, give us a helping hand. You know, I'm really glad you shared that, Angie. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't like to ask, yeah. but it would really help us out. Definitely. So now let's move on to our interview with Allison Butters. Hello, Allison. We're really looking forward to learning about your life as a NLP practitioner, which I understand stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. Yes. Hi, Allison. We're also going to learn from you today what a life coach does and why someone might need one. Well, thank you so much. I'm really grateful and I'm really looking forward. I just love conversations as a coach. This is my, it's what lights my soul up. So I'm really looking forward to this. So thank you both so much for the invitation. Oh, well, the pleasure so is ours. Yes. But, you know, before we go into learning about your occupation, which I'm really kind of excited to learn about, why don't you tell everyone where you're originally from and where you're living now? I certainly can. I'm, well, initially, well, from in the, I'm based in the UK. I am an international life coach. I'm based in the UK at the moment, and I was um, born and raised in a small town just on the northeast coast, very much near to the North Sea. So I was very blessed to grow up around coastal walks and the beach. And just as the pandemic started and the world paused, I moved to the northwest in Manchester. And that's where I'm currently, that's where I currently am at the moment. 
Well, when you grew up, did you have a favorite childhood memory? It sounds like kind of a wonderful place to yes, grow up. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it certainly was because where I grew up, there's lots of coast and there's lots of country because you'll have heard of like the Yorkshire Dales and North Yorkshire. So it is just, obviously I'm biased, yeah. <laughs> but it's just an absolutely glorious the world. And there's so many beautiful memories of growing up and just having, and I think that's what I've done latterly as well, is reconnecting to nature and those things that were important to me when I was younger. I've probably recalibrated myself and come back to those things as well. Oh, lovely. That does sound lovely. Well, now that we know a little bit more about you, let's move on to our interview. And I know that when we talked initially, you told us that you weren't always a life coach. What did you do prior to pursuing that career? And why did you make the shift into your current occupation? If we've got about several hours, um, Rod and Inji, we could go <laughs> through my CV. And there's, there is quite a lot, uh, quite a lot there. I did my, my first degree was in humanities. And then after a while, I've always loved serving people. So if you looked back the golden thread and the commonality of all the roles that I've had, it's always been about helping and supporting people to be the best person that they can be or supporting communities as well. So when I got to, I'd worked, there's organizations in the third and charitable sector, which I've worked with. I've worked in universities. I've worked in private practice. I've worked in public domain as well. I've got a very eclectic background, which I think has all really enhanced and brought me to where I am now. So when I got to my 30s, I trained as a lawyer. I'd left where I was doing at that time. But then I'd left the legal profession because I couldn't help and serve people in the way that I wanted to. So I would then worked predominantly as a housing professional for about 12 years, basically helping people support tenancies and support communities. A lot of that was change management and um, really, you know, just helping and serving people. And that's what's always been really important. But once I'd got to a certain point, because I'd, I'd experienced burnout quite a lot, mm -hmm. I probably had a habitual pattern of burnout. And I realized I wasn't aligned with myself. So in December 2019, I burnt the boats and I left my corporate stuff behind. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. But like a lot of people, I knew what I didn't want to do any longer. And then as we went into when the world paused, right. that gave me that space for introspection. And that's when I decided that I could serve people in a different way by being a coach. Because basically, I'd been a consultant, advisor and mentor, but all throughout my life, I think it was coaching that, that was always at the foundation of everything that I've done. Wow. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's quite a background, but it really led you to where you are today and also gave you the knowledge and the experience to be able to be a life coach, which is really, I think, well, Yeah, all, the, so all the life experiences that we all have, hopefully mm -hmm. we learn from them. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully at some point in our life, we pull that all together and make something happen, which you obviously exactly, have done, exactly. Allison. You know, why don't you tell us and our listeners what a life coach and NLP practitioner, what does that actually mean? Okay, that's a really good question. And to, not to give you sort of jargon, which I don't think really helps anybody. And you gave a really clear sort of descriptor when you opened up. Uh, Rod. So neuro, that's about our nervous system and our neurological responses. So basically everything we think or experience causes a neurological response, a state or a chemistry in our body. And then that links to the linguistic part, which obviously relates to language. And that's really... How do I describe it? How we see our world and ourselves by using language, both as a descriptor and what it creates in terms of meaning and our experience. And then the programming is our automatic programs, ones that are probably invisible to us. Those patterns and spontaneous unconscious responses, which when we learn how to change, 
that's when we can grow and we can develop. Does that give you, it's quite a wordy description. So what I would say is how to see it more simply. It's like a computer program. And what I do is have a look what's driving that and then basically do a defrag, have a look at those programs because it's not about learning. A lot of the time it's on learning and we have a look at that and I work with my clients to look what's behind those patterns and what's not serving us and then to basically through um, neuroplasticity put new programs in there which allow us to be who we truly are. That's very interesting because I think we all at some point sit around and go, gee, I just wish I could defrag my brain right, from yeah. all these thoughts, mm-hmm. all these ideas mm-hmm. that are floating around, good good ones and positive ones, negative ones mm-hmm. and not so positive ones. And we just try to get rid of that. And it's my understanding based on what you've been saying now is that you can help people defrag, degauss, clean that out of their clean brains. Brain. That, that mm-hmm. I can see as being very useful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it certainly is. And it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of bravery to step towards that because it can be really uncomfortable. And we have to have a level of honesty about ourselves to step into our own integrity and our own, you know, our own power. It takes a lot to do that, to be our authentic selves. And if we look that 95% of what we actually do is subconscious, there is so much, like I say, those patterns and those behaviors that are driving our behaviors. I have the view that clients are beautiful and amazing human beings and souls. And what we do is we just take out all of the things that aren't really true to you. And then we just turn up the magnificence because everybody's amazing. And it's just giving them that space to be heard and to be seen and to be them true, their true selves. That's really an amazing thing to say, because I just saw something on Facebook that was so entirely true. And it really resonates with what you said, where they said that you talk nicer to your pets than you do to your inner self. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah you're, you're, totally you're, in here. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of interesting that we really have to work hard at being nice to ourselves. Yeah. Right? I mean, and, learn, self, and learn. Yeah. Kindness and compassion to ourselves. I say, and you will have seen this in the public sphere as well, you know, speak to ourselves as we would our best friend Mm -hmm. with again that language that we use can be really it can really be diminishing who we are and it's capturing that and changing that and then turning it around and that really helps as well with that that reprogramming as it were you know uh, because i'm a gemini and they say gemini's have two personalities Uh I've always felt very fortunate that the twins inside me, they really like each other and they always have a really good time (laughs) together and they're always very, they're always very supportive of each other. And they go, Hey man, you do that really great. You go Rod or whatever. (laughs) So I I think our self-talk is critical to our happiness. And if you're by yourself in a room and you find yourself in bad company, you need to change Uh that. Yeah, definitely. There's so much truth in that. So much truth. Now, Alison, where do people pick up that habit of being self-critical? It can come from so many, so many different things. We've got the external world and how we filter that. So, again, that's about the language. It can be those programs. It can be values. It can be beliefs. It's attitudes. And all of those are sort of compressed And that sort of drives internally, it drives our state, it drives our physiology. And that then becomes like the sat nav for our our behavior. Hmm. Okay. You know, and also, is it not true that depending upon how you're raised, if you have a a well-meaning relative that is trying to encourage you, but they encourage you by... Criticizing, proselytizing, yeah, <laughs> proselytizing criticisms or throwing those at you. Doesn't that help with your self-esteem? Yeah, all of those things and those what make up us, that conditioning 
And I strongly have the belief that, you know, everybody does the best job that they can in that circumstance. And that's our parents, our caregivers. But if you look at the generational change that has happened and how much more awareness that we have now. So a lot of the things might come from a place of love. But like you say, if you look at it, it's like saying to a child, you know, be careful. And even that, if that's said often enough, it comes from a place of love because that's our job to keep, you know, our children safe. That can in later life, that might magnify or percolate as somebody being really, you know, anxious or it could be something else. The human brain is very, very complex. And those distortions that happen, that's, again, what can drive those behaviors that, that emerge. Hmm, that's so interesting. I know that when we talked earlier on the conversation that we had, you mentioned that you are also a hypnotist. Can you tell us about that? How does that work in concert with your other being a life coach? Yeah, the hypnotism, again, it's about really getting deeper underneath those patterns, underneath what's going on. And it's putting somebody in a state. The most important thing in a coaching relationship which is an equal partnership because I'm learning Mm -hmm. as much as I can, you know, about I'm learning as much as in that space as well. But what we are doing in with hypnotism, we're providing a really safe space for people to get really underneath that subconscious and have a look at it. And then again, we can, it's shining a light on those patterns and those behaviors. And then what we can do, but it has to be done very carefully and it has to be within the so much, I think there's sort of a lot of sort of misnomers around hypnotherapy sometimes, but what it does, it can be really effective as well. You know, I want to go back and do a little bit of a follow-up before I ask you my next question. Mm-hmm. One thing I think it's important for people to understand that if they had a parent or a relative or a friend that is giving them advice and it seems very uncomfortable, but you have to try to mm-hmm. step back and understand that how they were raised and how their grandparents were raised, and it could go back generationally. Sometimes things that, uh, if for lack of a better term, these little head trips that people put on us are generational. It's something that started five generations ago, and it just keeps being carried forward. And that's what people generally only think about when they give Mm -hmm. advice. They're not really giving advice from their current state of thinking. They're just repeating something that their parent or their grandparent or somebody repeated to them. I think that that unfortunately happens a lot. It does. It's like layers of igneous rock. It can be compressed and compressed. And like you said, it can go back generations as well. And that's the joy of coaching or other elements in that, you know, some people, if it's, I'm not, um, I'm trauma informed, but I'm not a therapist. So we have to be really careful. Like you say, Rod, if it's something that's perhaps having a really deep impact and it's trauma then it might be that there might be other options to explore because the thing with NLP it's about the best outcome for the client so but like you say there's so much that we go on but once we have it's that understanding of ourselves once we're in that space that non-judgmental space that coaching provides we can really fetch those things into the light. And once we do that, then we can start to understand them. Very good. That's very interesting. Wow. You know, I, I, considering what's going on in the world today, and I don't think there's a lot of people that are real happy about it, but people are desperately trying to reduce stress mm-hmm. and they certainly want to live more happily. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Alex, so what, what do you do to help them get in a better frame of mind when dealing with stress and anxiety? Okay, well, it's a good analogy because I'm trained as a mental health first aider as well. So there's a really good tool there which we describe stress as like a bucket. So once we keep adding more things into that bucket and keep adding more water into that and the fuller that it gets without releasing it, so that could be relationships, it could be work, 
It could be a whole host of things. It could be our emotional health. If we're not releasing that water out of the jug, that's when we get to what we call like emotional snapping and stress. So this is why I am really an advocate of self-care because we have to look after ourselves first. The main responsibility we all have for our emotional wellness is to ourselves. So however... And it's about your adaptation energy as well. Once you get low and things build up and you're not releasing that by having a walk, being hydrated, you know, being in a safe space, being creative, that's when that bucket just gets fuller and fuller and fuller. And that's when that stress builds up. That impacts our bodies from a neurochemical point of view as well. So then we get more cortisol, we get more adrenaline. And that's when we really experience stress. So it's again, it comes back a lot of things that I work on, Rod and Inji, is about awareness. And our body will be telling us that if we're not, this happened with me when I wasn't listening to my body. Once we get to a certain point, your body will give you a smack around the chops and go, you need to be doing something differently here. And that will represent in your relationships it will be there and it will be visible in your sleep, in your nutrition. It can manifest in so many different ways. Yeah, like a door slamming on your yeah. rear end, right? Yeah. It's yeah. time to move exactly. on. Exactly. Yeah. The door, the door yeah. slams yeah. shut. You look back and go, wow, I couldn't even believe it closed that quickly. That episode mm-hmm. of our lives changed. Yeah, that and chapter it, changed. That chapter changed <laughs> quick. and quick. Yeah. yeah. And it's about being honest with ourselves and having the bravery to seek support as well. Because if we're suppressing all of those things, it does build up and it's going to have an impact. And then it'll start to represent in more of, um, on, you know, in terms of mental health and things like that. So it's really important to have that awareness, to have that time for yourself and not be in this societally we're driven to be in this state of busyness or productivity Mm -hmm. and not creativity and that doesn't really serve us that's really interesting because my next question to you is going to be about achieving goals and still maintaining a healthy happy outlook what is your advice regarding that that's a really good question and i think first of all we have to get to we take a couple of steps back Because once somebody wants to go into that space where they want to achieve something, that means they've gone through a process and they're ready to embrace change, which is really important. And the things with goal setting is that they've got to be realistic and achievable. There's a lot of science that if people get overwhelmed, Mm -hmm. then they will just take a backward step. They're not going to walk, work towards that. So again, having that support, breaking those things down to see what they actually want and how they're going to be best supported to work towards that. That is very interesting because there's many people that have a lot of ambition and they are very, you know, intelligent. They, they know what they're doing, but then they'll get up to bat and all of a sudden it's like they can't do it. Oh, they sabotage themselves. Yeah, they can't do it. Yeah. 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 We're really good as human beings at sabotaging ourselves. And when I said about those beliefs and patterns and those that inner programming that's when that negative voice might start to start I call my inner voice Bernard and we have regular chats so it might be that you get to the point where right okay yeah I can do this I want to achieve this so I want to say for example do 10,000 steps a day Mm -hmm. but that inner narrative might say hang on a minute when 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 you're going to start to do this how is that going to be possible and that's when that that inner narrative can sometimes be self-defeating. All the people around us, even though they're well-meaning as well. So it's about having that support around us to be able to do that because any change is uncomfortable and it, it can be, but what we are used to, you'll have heard of the four zones. So ostensibly we're in our comfort zone, but when we start to get moving out of our comfort zone, we go into the fear zone And that's when people go, oh, hang on a minute. 
this feels a bit icky. Am, am I doing the right thing? Mm. And like that elastic band, they might then go back to the comfort zone and not actually work within that and start to really manipulate that change. I like that term, inner narrative. Yeah. We, mm-hmm. so, yeah. we all talk ourselves in and out of stuff all the time. I'm curious as to what personal challenges you faced when you decided to become a life coach. I can't imagine that that just popped into your head and you became one the very next day. No, Rod, I took, it's a huge amount of inner work. I didn't really like the person that I was before. Self-love wasn't something I had. And the person I was, I was a very loving and giving person, but the person I was in my corporate role That's not the person I am today. I'm far more grounded and present. And how I see it, it's like a roomy quote that we have to clean our own house out first. Otherwise, I'm doing my clients a disservice. So I've done a lot of work on myself to really clear myself so I'm aware of my what we'd call out my shadow side as well. Mm -hmm. And what I've done through that process, which has taken several years, and it's always ongoing. I have coaching myself. We're never, ever going to stop learning. And it's about, and I can only take a client as deep as I'm prepared to go. So I really have to have that vulnerability and model through my own personal leadership about making sure that I'm in the best position when I sit down in front of my client to hold that emotional space for them. That's a very candid and very open answer, and we greatly appreciate that, and I know our listeners will too. Yeah, it's so genuine. You know, it's genuine. Really and you, like you You show an eloquence of your vulnerability, but how you've managed to apply what you're learn to yourself and what you learn from others and reapply that back to yourself, which I I assume ultimately helps everyone that's connected to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. It's those ripples that go out because we can't, I'm only responsible for myself, my own emotional well-being and the change that I can do. But my leadership of that has those ripples because coaching invariably will improve your relationships because it improves how we communicate, first of all, with ourselves and then with everybody else. So other people, I described it as a to a client earlier on. This might be a, a better analogy. We're only responsible for our own hot air balloon. So I've taken quite a lot of sandbags out of my hot air balloon, but I can't expect anybody to get into mine, and nor would I want to get into somebody else's. They've got to be on their own path. They've got to have that desire for change and to develop and grow themselves as a human being. You know, there's an old statement, an old saying, and I believe it's Russian, actually, where if you want a cleaner world, you need to start by sweeping off your own steps first. And uh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true, though. It's very profound, actually. You know, when you were talking about a life coaching I do wonder, what is the very first thing that you try to discover about the person that is coming to you requesting uh, being a life coach? Yeah, or be, yeah, being helped. Being helped, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, the first thing, I think it's not about me. It's definitely all about the client. And the first and most important thing is absolutely listening to the client and listening to understand And once we do that, the client's nervous system will respond. And that's when that trust and that rapport opens up. So, again, I tend to take things a few steps back. So it's about me being present in that interaction and in that space, that communication with my clients. Mm -hmm. And then I will be listening and I will be evidencing and working through. It's a bit like the minority report. I'm picking out certain things and then joining those dots. First of all, Ingie and Rod, it might be the first time that a client's actually had somebody listen to them in that non-judgmental way. Mm -hmm. So that takes time to build up to build up that trust. 
But then what I'm doing is listening. And then because as with NLP, it's all about the results. There isn't a fixed formula. It's about what works best for the clients. There will be a commonality of things that come up. A client may think and represent and say, you know, I'm not very confident and I need to work on this. And we will work on that. But again, it's about going underneath and having a look at those programs that are running and finding out where that's come from and then exploring that with them. Some clients might want to, you know, for example, want to do public speaking or something like that and do other things. So it's very client driven, but there will be like common themes that that usually come up. And confidence is one of them, anxiety, their emotional well-being. But it's about getting the client in their parasympathetic nervous system initially. So they're in that rest and digest state and then they're receptive. They feel held. They feel safe. That's when they open up. You know, I think what happens also, a lot of people never really have the opportunity to sit down and actually talk to someone that doesn't know them real well. You know, they're like, they may be afraid. Yeah, they're more objective. They may be afraid to say something to their wife because the wife may be critical about something or a relative or a a well-meaning friend. But if they can talk to somebody Mm -hmm. like like you, where you're objective Mm -hmm. and you're non-judgmental and you're just kind of acting as a you're giving them a roadmap to follow and then you start out gradually and then it moves on to becoming more successful. And speaking of success, you know, we all, we all, we hear often that if you want to be successful at any endeavor, and there's some debate on this, that you should follow your passions. What are your thoughts on that? Yes. And I understand there is a lot of um, discussion and debate about that, but it's really good that we have those discussions and those debates when I found out, I found out my genetic blueprint, which I didn't find out till I was nearly 50. And if I'd have had that information earlier on, then I might have made very different choices because that gave me a huge amount of understanding. And as we referenced with my CV earlier, I've worked in a lot of different environments. And again, there was a lot of breadcrumbs and clues there, and those things would have come to light. And I've now gone back to really my true self and what I'm passionate about and what my purpose is, and and that's helping and supporting people. Some people don't have that belief, and that's perfectly fine, and and that's okay as well. But I am... I'm of the view, of the view that we do have a passion, we do have something that uh, drives us, and once we again open up, we shed all of that. We have a lot of unlearning, and once we get underneath that, then we find out what we actually are driven to do, what we're here for, and what we can do, and that's our purpose. Well, congratulations on discovering yourself. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. I'm still thinking about people wanting to achieve their goals, dreams, et cetera. But what do you think is the number one cause not to pursue your dreams or ambitions? There's multiple things, but I a lot of it, if you look at it, the common denominator, there's usually two. And when I propose this with clients, it can be fear of failure or fear of success. That is very interesting because it both am- amounts to the same thing of no action, right? Yeah. Or, or, or drawing <laughs> yeah, yourself yeah. back. No action, I like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. That's it. And it can lead to that. Like I said, that puts us into our, our sympathetic nervous system when we're in, you know, flight, flight or freeze and our body and our neurochemicals are working against us because we've got all of that subconscious stuff going what you're trying to do, this is not going to happen. It might be that nobody in your family's gone to university. It might be that nobody's been an entrepreneur in your circle. Yes. There could be loads of things there. Proximity is really powerful. And once you start to have a new language and have different discussions, you then see that there's no boundaries. Everything is possible and life is limitless. It does take a lot for people 
to embrace that. When we look at our brains, the neuroplasticity, it takes our brains, our neurons are like um, an old LP. I'm old enough to know what those are. Some of your audience probably have no idea what that is, (laughs) but an old record. (laughs) It's those grooves that are warm and those old grooves take time to change, but they can build up. And once we go into the coaching relationship, Within about four weeks, clients are then noticing and evidencing change. And when we mentioned the zones before, that's them coming out of where they're comfortable, where they feel safe and where they belong. And that's when they're starting to experience growth. But it's a little bit uncomfortable because we go then to, you know, vulnerability takes a lot of truth and it takes a lot of courage and it's understandable when people get there and they go whoa 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 hang on a minute what have I signed up for I'm just going to go back to the day job that I've had for five years I can pay my mortgage I can look after my family and that's enough and I respect that and I understand that people do that but they might be limiting what they're actually what their purpose is You know, I'm going to ask this question because I'm I'm anxious for Angie to answer the next question. But in maybe just a few words, maybe five words or less, what motivates you most, Allison, when you're helping other people? Five words or less. Five words or less. That's a a tough one. Um, Let me think. Five words or less. Okay, you can use more words. (laughs) I was going to say, that's not a lot of words. (laughs) I think that it comes down to what's motivating you. What's motivating you? Yeah. What What motivates me is supporting people to live the life they were meant to lead. Excellent. That's a great answer. That's very cool. When you have a job that you can do that. I am in a as your goal. That's very cool. I am in a very you know graceful position that I get to do something that lights me up in the way that it does. And that level of gratitude runs very, very deeply. Well, bravo on that one. Yeah. Okay. So my question would be, what would your advice be to all of us when we have those days when we cannot get motivated? Is there any simple thing that's kind of encompassing most people? I think, first of all, be kind to yourself. Be compassionate. We're not, you'll have heard of that term, which I'm not a fan of, but it's like toxic positivity. We're all human living a human experience and we will have days when we're not motivated. And, and like I said before, we're not meant to be doing all of the time. We're meant to be a human being. So first of all, just check in with yourself and find out what that is. It could be you just need some time out. You might just need a walk in nature. Mm -hmm. It could be other things. So explore, get curious and listen to what your body is saying to you if you're not motivated. And if it is, if you've done all of those like little checks with yourself and had that inner narrative, then work it through and go through those, challenge those thoughts, because thoughts are not facts. And sometimes we might have a thought like, oh, I'm not good enough. You know, I'm not good enough to do this. But have that conversation with ourselves and then just go, actually, I've achieved this before. This is what I've achieved last week. So it's having that that is that fuel. Then we go, okay, yeah, I can do this. And change can be overwhelming. So it's about not doing too much at once. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of science to support small incremental steps, and that will lead to sustainable and substantive change rather than, you know, I'm going to jump out of an airplane tomorrow. Right. Well, okay. well, let's explore that. But let's break that down into smaller chunks. And then it doesn't seem as intimidating and as overwhelming. Yeah. The first thing you need to do is to learn how to fold your parachute. That's so mm-hmm. true. And also yeah. that you're not, a, you're not a robot. Like it's okay to have yeah. feelings, but move past them. Yeah, we're all human. We're all human. And when we have those days, you know, when you want to watch Netflix and have ice cream, great. That's Do so those nice. things. <laughs> yeah. If that nurtures you in that moment and that's what you need, 
then again, it's not about judgment and it's not about self-judgment. You might just need a little bit of time out. And then the next day you might wake up and go, yeah, let's do this. I'm, you know, I'm back on. That's we can do this. Oh, very good. That's very good. What about you, Allison? When you have those times that you find it difficult to keep pursuing your passions, what do you do? How do you motivate yourself? I do that check in with myself because I have a coach as well. So my coach, I've got that level of support around me, which I'm really that I'm really grateful for. But if I wake up because I absolutely love what I do now, when I sit down at my desk and I get to engage and connect and have those conversations, those impactful conversations, that lights me up. So it's a big warning sign and a bellwether to me when I go, I'm not okay. And that might be my emotional well-being needs a check. It might be that I need some time out. It could be different things. So I, that's the things that I do. And I haven't got any problems in pressing pause anymore. I serve my clients and I have to be in a certain position. So if I'm not going to be okay myself, I'm not going to serve my clients to the highest level. Oh, sure. So I really need, I really need to find what that is and then dig within that. My own emotional health and mental health history, which I've been really candid and open about, it was very, very poor earlier on, you know, and I've made quite dark choices. So I'm not going to go back to that space. So I really need to make sure that I'm nurturing and nourishing myself. That's that self-care that we all need to do for ourselves. Very good. Does your coach have a coach? I think all coaches have a coach. (laughs) Because they know better. Yeah, they know know better. They're smart about that. Okay, okay, so Angie's going to ask my all-time favorite question to you. Oh, okay. Is it time to do that already? Oh, my gosh. This went fast. Okay, so now we ask you the question that we ask all of our guests, and that is if you could sit on a park bench and chat with anyone from the past, who would it be? That's a beautiful, a beautiful question. I think one person that I've learned most in terms of leadership, humility, would be Nelson Mandela. He's one of my personal heroes, and I think that would be an absolutely incredible, just a beautiful, heartwarming discussion to have. It's interesting that you should say that because, interestingly enough, you're not the first person to, to recognize that. That Nelson was, Mandela. But, but We've I can heard see that why, before. though. Yeah. He's such a pivotal person. Well, his life experiences yes. and how he oh, overcame the challenges that he faced. Yes. Uh, God forbid any of us have to go through those. But he was also very peaceful, like Gandhi, too, you know, very Kinda peaceful like, yeah. inside. Like inner, inner peace and inner, like... Uh, knowledge and um, maturity inside. What would be the first question you would ask him, Allison? I would ask him what he thinks was responsible for the, just the absolute humility he had as a human being and where he developed that, where that came from, because that's one of the main things that stands out. I think one of those conversations was when a There was a prison officer, I think, in a restaurant. I can't remember verbatim and fully, but this prison officer, I think, was in the same space. It could have been a restaurant, and they were they were out having a meal. And then, you know, people thought, "Oh, how is this going to go?" But the way that he engaged with that person, and I think invited them and was open with them, and that that level of like trust and acceptance to be able to to do that and that that forgiveness I think that's just an absolute gift so it's something that really fascinates me and I would love to know how that how those seeds were planted and and how they were grown you know there was a research study done in Texas several years ago about people that had terminal diseases and they asked everybody if there was somebody in your life that you could not forgive something that somebody did to you that was unforgivable and you would not forgive them. And every single one of them had someone that they said, you know, there's no way I will ever, ever forgive that person. You know, they would jokingly say over my dead body. And the physicians Mm -hmm. and the researchers all came to the conclusion that the people that all of a sudden learned to forgive those people that transgressed on them became healthier. 
their health recovered. But the people that remained bitter and would not forgive anyone, they're the ones whose health conditions became worse and worse. Anyway, that's a very interesting response you gave. That's another whole show, basically. Yeah, literally. Yeah, really. <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah I, and yeah. unfortunately, we've run out of time. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> but I have to say, Ellison, your openness and your willingness to share your life's career and how you help manage others, but also the personal uh, challenges that you faced and how you came to the conclusion as to what it is that you wanted to achieve in your life. Congratulations, and thank you for such a great conversation. It is, it is. And I, and I think a lot of people didn't really necessarily understand what a life coach really does. So thank you for clarifying that, and thank you for your generous insight on, you know, how we can maybe manage on ourselves if we are not going to go to a life coach right now. Well, no, thank you. And I'm just so grateful. And if your audience, your listeners just take, you know, one thing away that, you know, change is possible. You don't have to have this fixed set of circumstances and you can in the right environment with the right support, you can change and you can make ones, you can have a life that you generally want to lead. Very good. Yes, thank you so much. And now let me let everyone know before our time runs out that if you'd like to know more about Allison Butters, we will have links for her under the show guest tab on thoughtrowpodcast.com so everyone can learn more about her and connect with her on social media. And please check out her website. Yeah, it's it's well worth doing that. Thank you, Allison. Thank you for so being much, Allison. You, you were wonderful. Thank you so much. I have deep gratitude and everybody for their time and just listening. Thank you so much. Also, if you're enjoying our podcast, both Ron and I would really appreciate you buying us a cup of coffee. Just go to thoughtrow.com, scroll down a bit, and you can find that link right on our website on the homepage. It's really easy to do, by the way. Yes, it is. And all the money we receive goes to our production costs. Yep. And primarily because we want to keep our show commercial free and we want to continue to bring you the best quality content with great guests. That's right. Thank you for listening to Thought Row Podcast. I'm really glad you tuned in today. We hope you enjoyed the thoughts and ideas we shared with you. We post a new podcast every week, so remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. So it's bye for now from my husband Rod and I, wishing everyone...